Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, another edition of the uh, Authentic Caribbean Rum uh, Hangouts. Um, we have uh, great company today, as usual, and uh, we're going to be talking about um, basically the differences between the trends in the North American uh, market uh, and the European market, as well as as individual country trends uh, at the moment. Uh, Authentic Caribbean Rum has been um, delivering activities for for a while now in in, in Europe, and, and we'll be aiming to to do the same in North America. Um, so we have um, our Authentic Caribbean Rum panel members from Chicago, uh, Berlin, and London today. Uh, I'll just introduce to the guys. Uh, first of all, Amit Sood from Shaker in London. Hello, Amit. Uh, Hello, everyone. We have to his uh, right, we have Bastian Heuser from Berlin. Hello, Bastian. Hi, everyone. And last but not least from Chicago, Peter Vestinos. Hello, Peter. Hello. Please excuse the uh, sparse background. We're in a construction zone here. Hey, it's good. It's good. Uh, very vintage. I mean, actually, very craft. Very craft, which is the, the theme right now in the States, isn't it? Oh, for sure. So let me just, uh, I mean, there's, um, you know, the craft distilling is one of the big things now, premiumization. There's a lot of things going on, especially in the North American market. But let me just get your first impressions on, on what you think the current situation of the spirits market is in general from your perspective. You know, these guys have been working behind the bars for years. Now they work more in a consultant role for as spirits uh, experts. So what, what is your, your, you know, is it picking up? Is the economy helping? Uh, what do you guys feel? Amit, please. Uh. It's funny enough, London never really suffered from any kind of downturn economically wise. Uh, it was the UK wide problem, but the major cities you know, Manchester, Liverpool included, even places like Bristol, they've continued to just do so well in opening new bars. And You know, we don't so much describe it as sort of craft here, but it's just bartender-led bars, uh, people doing everything on a niche kind of basis where they're looking to just specialise and own what they do uh, and to to become famous for something. Um, so the, the influences have been massive and it's been going on for a really long time. But bars just keep on opening up, and it's just been fantastic and refreshing for the industry. And everyone is is so into it. The consumer has become more educated, more you know, more openly that, that they care so much about what they drink. Um, you know, they care so much about what they eat. And overall, bartenders are being nourished so much by consumer interest. Um, the industry is in a great place. Um, and it continues to benefit from um, from all the little changes and the little sort of modernizations uh, that have happened. Um, that's not to say that people stand still. There's still lots of advancement going on, and people are always trying to get better and not stand still. But at the moment, you know, uh, London has been heading up. Not just a UK-wide thing, but you know, very much along with other major cities in the world, a whole global sort of trend of opening great bars with with, with great drinks programs. So uh, very refreshing and great to be part of it. Sounds good. Um, is that is that the same case uh, in Germany, Bastian? Do you feel the industry is uh, thriving? Um, well, um, I, th I think it's um, in in general that the the trend in Germany is. Um, they're actually drinking less and less alcohol. Um, that's like the big major major thing. Uh, I, I think the, there's lots of um, other countries that experience the same. So basically, um, people are uh, yeah are, are just drinking less, um, but um, at, still at the top, um, people um, start to be more educated, just as Amit said. Um, they uh, realize that um, that a good um, quality spirit um, costs um, a certain amount of money, and um, they seem to be more open to to actually spend that money um, now. But I would st still say that the um, that this trend is is not something that has uh, already reached uh, the mainstream. Um, it's something still um, very. 
Well, uh, very petite. Um, if you see the the whole market in Germany, um, it's still very price driven, and um, the big um, well, the big companies are still making making the money. It's not the craft spirits. But I would still say that. And 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 well, the craft spirits is big in 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 the states, uh, but obviously there's a lot more going on. Uh, what what is the current situation over there, Peter? Um, yeah, it's difficult to just say uh, one current situation because, I mean, we're so massive and we're um, from coast to coast. We have different influences. Um, the craft movement has certainly caught on countrywide. It's amazing to see what's going on even even in airports around the U.S. that people are, are catching on to it. Um, we have uh, several things going on. You know, some people are, are trying to figure out how to provide craft cocktails in very casual, fast environments. So mm -hmm. you see a lot of um, pre-bottling of cocktails. You see a lot of cocktails going back into kegs uh, on draft. Uh, you see people trying to execute really craft cocktails, but in high volume and super fast. Um, you also see the home consumer uh, get into this. You know, as the economy goes down, people trend, tend to drink off-premise, tend to drink at home. So mm -hmm. what's great is uh, I see a lot of people offering cocktail classes at home. Uh, there's a lot of people investing in bar tools and investing in some premium spirits to stock their back bar. I have some great conversations with customers who are really excited about how their back bar looks at home and what their bar is stocked with. Um, but you also see people, I'd say particularly on the West Coast, uh, a little bit more comfortable drinking cocktails uh, earlier in the day um, and longer in the day. You also uh, see so you see a trend of lower proof cocktails, which I think is fantastic. Uh, I think people are more comfortable, again, drinking, um, but understanding that they can kind of moderate that a little bit. And a lot of lower proof cocktails coming into play now, which is, which is great. Cool. Um, and and what, what do you think explains the growth of, of, of old brands? Well, old, they're all old brands, but sort of Jack Daniels and Crown Royal. What is that? I mean, whiskey has really made, made a... A huge return, hasn't it? Uh, I'm sorry, you're talking, talking to me in the U.S. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry about that. For sure. Oh, hello, Joe. Hello, Joe. Um, yes, uh, for sure. We're we're actually reaching a point where. Um, hello. Oh. Sorry, we've had, we've had some technical difficulties with Toronto, but uh, he's sorry to interrupt uh, Peter. But we have uh, Joe here from Toronto. Can you hear us, Joe? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, fine, fine. Um, good to have you with us. Uh, we, we were talking about um, what's going on in the, the, you know, in the drinks industry generally, in the spirits industry. Amit was talking about how it was thriving in the UK, um, and Peter was just talking about the states. Uh, we were talking about how brands like Jack Daniels and, and Crown Royal and whiskey in general had made a, a huge impact. So I'll just leave uh, Peter to finish what he was saying, and then we'll talk about what's going on in the Canadian market if you want. Um, yeah, good. everyone's whiskey crazy at the moment, especially bourbon crazy, and what you're seeing that um, affect even some laws or some proposals, uh, the way uh, we manage our, our labeling and, and our bottling right now and our, and our barreling in the U.S., um, but what's interesting, it's, it's changing to some degree the flavor profile of whiskey. Um, you know, people are in a need to push out whiskey a little bit faster, so you're seeing some, you know, these trends in unaged whiskeys or non-aged whiskeys, and seeing trends in very lightly aged whiskeys, uh, just because people are trying to fill demand with getting these whiskeys out as fast as possible. And is that the same case in Canada? Has Canada gone whiskey mad, Joe? Yeah, absolutely. Bourbon and tequila, especially, are very popular right now. Yeah, and and what are, what are the other trends in 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 Canada? Would you say? Kidded about premium spirits, rum has, still has a long way to go. Yeah? Sorry. Your sound, the, sound, the sound keeps going on and off. I don't know if you can uh, maybe try another, a different mic or, um, or, or take the, the, the headphones off. Sorry, is that better? Yeah, I think so. I, I took my headphones off. Okay, cool. Sorry, that's my first hangout. It's all right. It's always there's always a first time for everything. Never forget your first time. <laughs> so, so yeah, you were telling us about uh, Canadian trends in the spirits market. Yes. Yeah, so in the past few years, consumers have become much more educated, for sure, about mm -hmm. premium spirits and uh, and manufacturing and what that entails. Yeah. 
Uh, I feel like rum still has a long way to go. Yeah. There's fewer people calling for premium rums. What do they call for? Uh, rum is still almost always being served with ginger ale or some sort of pop, Coca-Cola, okay. whereas especially bourbons and tequilas are being enjoyed more and more neat. I see. Is that is that is that the same in in Europe, Amit? Sorry. Okay, Amit. Amit. Sorry. Sorry. The sa the sound has gone off. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Sorry, I had muted my mic. Uh, bourbon is big business in in the UK. Um, once again, bourbon is sexy. Whiskey in general is sexy again. Um, lots of. Uh, credibility going to Japanese whiskey at the moment, which is really sort of uh, exciting the category. And, you know, flavor extensions have helped it as well. You know, Jack Daniels Honey has gone down the storm um, in the wider sort of consumer market. Uh, bartenders are a bit wary of these kinds of fads, but I think whiskey has been made accessible. Tequila bars continue to, uh, to sort of pop up. Um, a real, a real sort of pioneer in the tequila world, uh, Tom Estes, who, who sort of set up Ocho Tequila, and he's known on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, Tom opened a bar called El Novel in Covent Garden, which is his third tequila bar in Covent Garden, one tiny little part of London, and, and they're just absolutely flying high. Um, but there's a lot of sort of trend of, of mixing up um, great cocktail sort of programs with great food, um, and that has helped. Um, people to frequent, frequent places they probably wouldn't have been to before, um, and I think overall, um, you know, the the rum market's doing well as well. Um, you know, spice rum has been a massive sort of growth area in the UK, um, and a lot of the brands that we're looking after in ACR are actually really well known. And you know, you know, you can't go to many of the training sessions and not have brands like El Dorado and Chairmans and Brugal and even, you know, uh, Angus and well received. And on the lesser side, you know, those people that really know rum, they know the English harbors of this world and the Dorleys. But um, I think, you know, more and more, um, the market continues to grow and evolve in both an off trade sort of sense. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a clear, I mean, if you look at the statistics, in the U.S. especially, but across the board in, in, in Europe as well, it, there is a clear trend uh, of premiumization uh, in all categories. And rum, um, it's less so, but because perhaps um, it hasn't explained its premium offerings as well. Um, do you think that there's? Do you guys think that there's an opportunity for uh, for the category in this premium offering, Bastion? Oh, the, the mic, yeah. sorry. Sorry, yeah, sorry, uh, I un unmuted. Um, you mean for, for rum or...? Um, yeah, in, in, I mean, yeah. I mean, out of all the categories, it seems that the premium sector is growing at a lesser pace than the other, and then perhaps it's because it hasn't developed its, its premium offerings as much. Yeah, I... I I have a hard time finding that that we don't have enough um, premium rum offerings. Um, I believe it's. Uh, I believe there is enough uh, out there, um, but it seems to be um, that, uh, especially the the brands that actually have have a good liquid inside, sometimes are a bit weak on the marketing side, um, and then you see. These um, well, new brands who are really, really good in in marketing themselves, um, but have um, well, rather inferior liquid in in, in the bottle, um, and people still don't really um, grasp what rum is and and um, what kind of rules there are, if there are any rules. Um, it's uh, I think still a category that is. Um, well, that has not yet enough rules um, that a consumer can actually um, understand and, and uh, actually grasp from just looking at the bottle. Right, which is what we're trying to do uh, here. What, what do you think a, a campaign like the Mark uh, and you know, a set of criteria and rules that it's trying to set could help 
brands, consumers, and, and, and professionals? Um, I, I think it's, it's the right way. Um, when talking to bartenders, actually, um, a lot of feedback is it's not yet enough um, of rules. Uh, that's a, a pretty common feedback. Um, uh, people are actually, or, or, or bartenders, or people from the trade are actually expecting even more um, regulations and even more, well, um, clarification and, and, and uh, certain standards um, that, that uh, one can, uh, or, or one needs to adhere to. Right. Sort of, sort of like the, the bourbon or whiskey, Scotch Whiskey Association, yeah. which are sort of... Uh, Understood and 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 you know, accepted across the board. Um, there's a there's a trend, and I I'll go back to to the our European friends in a minute. But there's a trend uh, or a huge surge of of the craft movement, um, and I I just wanted to get get your opinion, Peter, as as to how that has affected the whole market and and how it's come about. Because it, it might be interesting to see if that could spill over to other regions like Europe, for example. How the craft movement has come about in the U.S.? Yeah, and, and how it has affected the market. It's, it's affected the market greatly. You know, you see um, where I've seen the biggest change is on the supplier and distributor side. And, and working in the U.S., we do have these different levels of... We have the suppliers who own the brands and the distributors who distribute them to the retail areas and then the retail areas, which are the bars and the restaurants. And the biggest change has been in how uh, suppliers and distributors sell. Now, a lot of them have had to create brand ambassadors or craft divisions, uh, have to in have invested heavily in these personnel to go out and be experts in these brands that a lot of sales reps who in the past were just used to working with very familiar brands and just used to taking orders. And Orders hadn't probably changed in many, many years. All of a sudden, these new brands are popping up and people are asking questions, and they, they, they just were not able to deal with that. And I was actually in one of these positions years ago with a large distributor in the U.S., where it's my job to educate the sales team and go out and educate about these brands. Um, that's where I've really seen a lot of big change. You have these people flood the marketplace now who are ambassadors, who are um, leaders of these craft divisions that go out and talk about the movement and kind of preach the gospel and talk about these brands. Um, and it's great to have these people in the marketplace uh, hitting at all different levels talking about it. Right, and, and have, having seen um, the trend in, in, in your market and having seen some of the uh, producers that in the Caribbean, do you think that, that they, these small sort of uh, artisan, sort of family-owned small distilleries could benefit from this trend and actually market themselves as sort of craft, handmade uh, liquid. For sure. There's a, there's a, I guess I'd say there's a lot of noise out there. You know, there's a lot of information. There's, everyone's looking for articles on craft spirits or tools. Every publication has something going on right now. Um, there's so many brands coming to the market and everyone's trying to get a, a place in that market. And at this point, you need an advocate. Uh, to go out and talk about your story and talk about your brand and talk about what's going on. You really, it's imperative at this point to have that uh, spokesperson in the market. Okay. Is that the case, uh, Joe? I mean, is the craft movement uh, as big in Canada as it is in the States? Uh, yes, especially in the beer department. The craft brewers are killing the major breweries right now. Okay. The major breweries are trying to respond in turn. As Peter was saying, it's that education campaign. It's having people on the ground going out there and telling your story, explaining how your beer is brewed in a small town by actual people. People are responding very well to that. And do you think it, it's it's got to do with with the um, with the cocktail culture, the sort of the sophisticated, you know, bars serving uh, drinks with a story, not just anything. Absolutely. I mean, take a view, Carré. It has much more of a story to it than uh, a rum and coke. Right. You know, I also, if I can chime in for a second, I think yeah. a little bit has to do with um, this sort of discovery consumers have. You know, when you first discover, when you have your first craft cocktail, you discover it and you, you bring it back to your friends and you talk about it and you get really excited about it and you bring your other friends to that bar and you're, you're really excited to tell your friends what uh, this this new spirit that you've discovered at this new cocktail. And I see it very much in the beer world. Uh, beer is 
insanely hot right now in the U.S. and you can open up a brewery and, and not meet demand very quickly. Um, but what I've seen the beer market be better at than everybody else um, is communication somehow. You know, they, they're very good with their, their apps and their online information and their beer ratings and when a new beer hits the market, um, the information gets around in that community very fast. Uh, and I'm really impressed with how they communicate what's going on in the beer world in, in these limited releases. And it's kind of that, that little discovery that I found this beer, I found this brewery, and this lim limited release came out. So I'm really impressed with what the beer market's doing right now. Yeah, I mean, a, a huge beer market, or the beer market, is obviously Germany. And I know craft breweries and craft beers are big there. But is, is the craft distillery movement that we've seen in the States uh, sort of... Uh, being replicated, or do we have that in in Europe, Bastian? Or, or yeah, ab absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I mean, look at the um, myriads of uh, gins that that are being um, being thrown on the market um, every day uh, here in Germany, but also in in, in other countries of Europe. Um, and I I would totally agree that the the uh, craft beer community and and they they really uh, know better how to market themselves um, I, I think that's that's something um, the a lot of craft uh, or new craft brands um, in the spirits market as well they they really um, they come from well, they are kind of a new world um, and and they know how to market themselves very very good um, but um, but a lot of times, I I have to to say that uh, I think the liquid is is uh, just not um, up on the game, uh, and and um, that's something they they certainly have to, um, or a lot of uh, the producers have to work on. But uh, I I think in in Europe the the craft movement has has certainly um, or is is in the middle uh, of it uh, of us um, already. Um, no matter where you look, um, if it be if it's Italy, Spain, Germany, uh, the UK, um, the numbers of, of new spirits on the market is uh, is amazing on the one on one side, but uh, also quite um, well uh, overwhelming uh, on the other side. You, you know, I, I at least I, I'm I lost track of all the brands that are um, on the yeah. market now. I mean. From I, yeah, it's hard to keep up. And and from a sort of a, a global perspective or a marketing perspective, there are sort of a few trends on a massive scale. We've talked about the craft movement. We talk about uh, premiumization. You know, the growth of the premium sector is incredible everywhere. Um, but then there's there's other areas of growth, like for example, spiced rum or spiced spirits, uh, or new flavorings or innovation in drinks where you don't know if it's a vodka, a rum, or a gin, or a mix of everything. And to me, that seems that you know the market's sort of splitting into two very, very different segments. You, so you have the people who want a, a story with a drink and like the craft story and like something that's unique and very well made, and etc. And then you have um, sort of brands that are innovating to make their drink more accessible to the mass market. So. Is is that you think what's going on on a, on a massive scale? Anyone? Um, yeah, I mean, surprisingly, uh, I pulled up the Discus numbers recently, and I was surprised that rum is actually this the second largest category in the U.S., and over fifty percent of that is spiced rum. Would <coughs> um, you look at a brand like Fireball? Um, I got uh, you know, even with what's going on with it um, and the recalls. It is still an incredibly hot brand, uh, the cinnamon flavored spirit. Yeah, spice rum. Why, why do you think spice rum does so, or has been doing so well and continues to grow? I I I actually have a have a theory that um, that it seems to be. Um, if if you look at at bourbon uh, also, uh, bourbon the the flavored spirits, um, spiced rum. Uh, it it seems. To be um, on the on the base, on the base, um, we experience a trend towards um, sweeter flavors uh, once again after 
we had the vodka uh, kind of you know trend um, going on. Now it seems to be that the palate gets more and more sweeter. I even experienced that in 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 in, in cocktails. Uh, it, it seems to be um, that people are um, are going for it, for that, and um, that seems to be something some kind of trend. Uh, I I would guess. Right. I would I would have to agree as well because ultimately. You cannot, you cannot put a glass of rum in front of someone and, and get them to appreciate it all the time. I mean, in, 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 you know, in my day job of training bartenders, spice rum always is the most approachable product that they, they come across when we taste rums because they don't quite get light, dry, Cuban-style rum. They don't quite get heavy, pot Jamaican. But you give them a glass of Kraken and they're like, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> you know, so... You, know, you, you, you fill it up with ginger beer and you put a couple of squeezes of lime. They're like, oh my God, this is even more amazing. So, you know, Spice Drum has made rum accessible. But, you know, I wrote a piece about this on on, on, on the whole sort of, you know, uh, the work that we're doing, um, you know, on a, on, a, on a monthly basis. And, you know, I think Spice Drum drinkers will turn into the English Harbour or the Dawley's drinkers of the future so long as they stay, they stick to the category, they continue to be influenced by bartenders who, who want to take them on a, a sort of journey and progression through the category. Um, you know, I think exploration of one's palate is one thing that's definitely come about the globe um, as a result of more and more interest in, in, in food and drink. Um, I don't think that spiced rum has been bad for, uh, for rum as a category. I just think that uh, bartenders have to work very hard to to make sure that they they move people's interest in it onto other things because some of the spice drums on the market don't do justice to the great work that some producers do in trying to produce really well balanced authentic style rums which haven't been interfered with too much right um, what do you feel Joe do you think do you think uh, do you think there's a future for for uh, small uh, Caribbean rum producers in Canada, for example? I do. And I really love what Amit was just saying about uh, spice rum being almost a gateway drug to more premium rums down the line. Like when I started drinking coffee, I drank it with cream and sugar. And now I drink it black. Yeah. So perhaps the rum will go the same way. I'm seeing an explosion in people drinking Sailor Jerry and uh, ginger at my bar, and bars across Toronto. I think this is a great opportunity to educate about premium brands out there. Yeah, and 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 about the uh, sort of the the regulation, the, the you know, and the it's also about informing. We we've talked about the cover over issue. We've talked about the uh, the importance of, of rum for 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 the region. Um, I think you know it's it's part of building this story that actually people. I think a lot of people know about whiskey, and they know about tequila. Tequila has been it's it's an interesting. Spirit as well. They they've been able to tell their story, and I think that you know rum probably needs to build that into its its story, which which is as Bastian was saying. You know, I think it has enough good product in order to to make a run, but it just seems to be a little bit behind the other categories in terms of premiumization. Well, the awareness isn't there yet. Yeah. I'm not sure about your markets, but in at least the Canadian market, there's a very strong brand ambassador role for whiskeys. But there's only a couple of rum ambassadors in Toronto right now telling these stories. Yeah. I'm curious, do you have a lot of rum ambassadors in America or in Germany? Yeah, we have a, we have a fair amount. Bastian, Havana, Havana is huge in, in, in Germany, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, Havana Club or, or Germany is the um, biggest export market for uh, Havana Club um, due to uh, our our uh, split history uh, and the East Germans uh, drinking Havana Club uh, for years and, and, and bringing that over um, to West Germany. So uh, it's it's huge. It's bigger than Bacardi. Um, so uh, that's that's quite quite something. Um, and uh, yes, they they've been working with a brand ambassador, um, a national brand ambassador, and, and uh, regional ambassadors for I think about six or seven years now. So um, quite quite at the um, at the right time um, they started to do that. And, um, 
uh, did a good work. I think it's, you know, you, you just mentioned a very interesting point, which is the historical link of Cuba and, and Germany, and that being a driving factor in, in consumption uh, of Havana Club. And I think that that happens, and it certainly happens here in Spain with Dominican Republic rums and Cuban rums. Um, I know it happens in England with uh, sort of English style uh, rums from yeah, maple rums. Absolutely, you know, there, there is, the, but I think that's that's slowly diminishing as well. But I also think there's been a great interest for a very long time with holidaymakers from from Britain going to the Caribbean um, and people bringing back their favourite tipple with them. Um, but you know, just to comment upon the brand ambassador thing, you know, a long time ago, many brands invested heavily in brand ambassadors across the board. But rums benefited from that in the UK. I mean, you know. Many of the brand ambassadors that look after the brands within the, within the campaign are are friends of mine, you know, and they've been a great source of help and inspiration and support. And I think, you know, um, I can only see brand ambassador sort of programs uh, within brands just continuing to grow uh, here in the UK because it's been so good for not just the trade but the off trade to connect with these guys who are a source of inspiration and, and extra knowledge. And they they reach and they target people that sales forces can't. Um, some of the very small brands, you know, you've got a guy selling and the brand management and the ambassadorship all being done by one person. Uh, but, you know, as brands succeed and, and, and grow, they then they expand their team very, very quickly. Um, so it's, it's, just, it's just a little bit behind with rum as a whole. Um, it's not quite reaching the heights of where it, it needs to be. Um, I think the brands have got a lot to sort of do in regards to that in the UK. Uh, when, in terms of the global market, they, they need to work on matching matching the liquid with the story, with the bottling, with the marketing and everything, and I think it will happen. But there's dangerous ground being trodden on as well with some brands. I mean, you know, I don't want to mention any names, but there are, there are certain things being released into the market that are, are trying to drill sort of niche rums, but they may be conveying messages that can give... Um, can give the wrong impression to both consumer and bartender alike. So. Yeah, I think I mean it's clear from from what you guys are saying that there's a need to tell the story. And first of all, it starts with with with, uh, with uh, making that story and and actually being able. And then obviously the people the, through brand ambassadors or however it may be able to tell it. But there's also this linkage and the history and the heritage. And you know what is what is the 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 link. Uh, in the U.S. with rum, what is the historical link? Or uh, the historical link? I mean, rum built the U.S. Uh, it, I don't think a lot of people realize how important rum was in the building of the economy of the U.S. right before the revolution. Um, historically, when we've had uh, it actually happened a few years ago. It happened uh, post depression uh, when we were trying to build, uh, rebuild the economies. Uh, huge subsidies went into the rum markets in in the Caribbean for uh, U.S. producers, U.S. markets, um, U.S. producers. Um, you know, there's there's been a very close tie with rum and the U.S. economy uh, since the inception of the U.S. And and is that the case in Canada? Is um is it linked to the country, or or is it relatively new spirit that people are discovering? It's definitely relatively new. We don't have the same historical links. There's not really any rum made in Canada. I mean, I brought a bottle of Screech down to the Caribbean. <laughs> but even that's kind of a joke. <laughs> and so, and uh, we were talking before about, about um, uh, brands like Jack Daniels growing uh, incredibly well in the past few years. Same thing has happened with Crown Royal, which is a Canadian whiskey. So uh, how, how do you explain that? I mean, what, what, what have they been able to do? That has been quite a patriotic ad campaign, really tying in the idea that rye is a Canadian spirit. This is what Canadians drink. I see. And I don't think rum has the same connection in Canada, not yet, anyway. <laughs> no, I see. Um, well, um, I, I think we lost Peter for, for, for a minute there. No, I'm here. Oh, you're back. Excellent. Well, I mean... I don't know if, if you want to, I mean, we've been talking for about uh, half an hour. I don't want to keep you guys much longer. Um, are there just sort of closing statements on what you think 
the current state of affairs is in spirits and how Rome can adapt and make the best of it. I'll start with Joe. Um, number one is telling the story, as we said. Like, let's take let's take bourbon. The biggest uh, growing bourbon in Toronto is Bullet Bourbon, and the story of it being a frontier whiskey, uh, what pioneers drank. People are loving that story. Cool. How about in uh, in the states, Peter? Um, my cousin statement would be: I think we also need to look, uh, in addition to the story of uh, you know, whiskey has been very good about finding their vehicle. You know, Manhattan. Uh, these are very sickly drinks. The scotch market's been great about marketing different ways to chill your, your scotch and maybe large cubes of ice of certain glassware. Tequila's been great about telling people to take it out of the margarita and put it into a, uh, into a copita or a different style of glass. I think rum is still kind of thought of as rum and coke or um, even a mojito, which is a fantastic drink, but I think for these premium rums, we need to find that vehicle. How do we get uh, people drinking rum? A lot of people just don't know how to drink a premium rum. Uh, are we sipping it? Are we putting it into a cocktail? Are we shooting it? I think that vehicle is going to become very important for premium rum. Thank you. Bastian? Um, yeah, I, I would say um, um, better communication. Um, yeah, telling, telling the stories, um, uh, going out there, um, Having uh, not being um, how do you say that um, not being afraid that your your that that the inside is is not not good at all or or anything uh, really go out there and, and be proud of uh, what you have and uh, obviously focus uh, do more focus on um, on your premium qualities because uh, I think most um, rum producers. Still focus their communication uh, solely on um, on the mass market uh, products um, and uh, don't really tell uh, what other stuff they have. Um, and and whiskey producers uh, were a, a lot better uh, at that um, in the past. Excellent. And finally, Amit, what are your final thoughts? I think everyone's touched on. Make sure you tell the story. I think you need to find great storytellers and whoever they are, whoever you bring in to build that story of your brand, they've got to convey that message because that's what people buy. People buy into the person behind the message uh, just, just as much as what that message is. So great storytellers are important. I um, completely agree with, um, with what Peter said regarding what is, what is the medium of, of conveying the way that something should be consumed. Um, I'll pick up on El Dorado. They've had great success in the UK with the swizzle. They 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 own they own that drink. You think swizzle now as a as as a bartender, you think straight away El Dorado because they can communicate that through through year on year competitions. So I mean, that's a great classic rum drink as well. So I think that, that's really important. Um, but o overall, I'm you know I'm I'm really really I'm really really pleased about where things are in the UK. Um, and I think globally. You know, rum, rum has got work to do, but I still think it's in a great place. Um, and I think we're all in a key position to continue to do more and, and to throw our, throw our sort of hand in the air and say, look, we're, we're willing to do our bit and help out. So um, I think, um, you know, overall, um, let's see what 2015 brings, really. Let's, let's, let's see, indeed. Well, thank you, guys. Um, we'll be back soon, hopefully, uh, with other um, themes and obviously rum-related, as usual. Uh, Thank you again, guys, and uh, speak to you guys soon. Good to bye meet bye. all of you. Bye-bye. Have a nice day.